becoming aware. This morning I want to talk to you about the vessel of mercy. I've kind of merged a couple preaching series because my schedule got discombobulated this summer from various reasons, and so I'm kind of merging things together. I've talked about several vessels that in Israel, the potter would make seven different vessels. We've covered a few of them already. I want to talk about the vessel of mercy this morning, but first I want to share a little story out of my favorite author's, my favorite author John Ortberg's book. He writes this. He says, when I was growing up, the most dread, dreaded childhood disease was neither chicken pox, the measles, nor the mumps. It was a more subtle and mysterious disorder. It was highly contagious. There was no vaccine, no antidote, no antidote, and no inoculation. No one ever elaborated on what happened to you if you contracted the disease, but the mere mention of it struck terror in the hearts of me and my friends. It was, as we knew, a fate worse than death. The only way to be safe was to place any carriers of the disease in strict quarantine. Fortunately, they were easy to recognize. The disease was carried by girls. Every girl except my mother, John says, was loaded with it. He says, I'm not sure what the medical term was, but we called it cooties. <laughs> All the carrier had to do was to touch you, breathe on you, or look at you real hard, and you were infected. Nobody was crazy enough to touch somebody with cooties. It was as if all the carriers had a sign hung around their neck that said, don't touch. If I had known then that I'd end up with a house of four, three girls, I'd have gone crazy. I'm living in Cootiesville. That's where I grew up. I had five sisters and a mother. And I learned what cooties were at a young age. And I got cooties very early. Here's a picture of me with cooties at about 17. <laughs> Human beings need to be touched. Human beings need to be touched. That's you. That's people outside this building. That's 120,000 people in our 15-mile region. That's the 350, 380 million people in America. That's the 8.2 billion people on the planet. Gary Smalley and John Trent cite studies that people who experience meaningful touch on a regular basis actually live longer. That means that people that don't live shorter. Researcher Renee Spitz showed that infants who are not held and hugged and touched on a regular basis, even if their parents provide all the food and the clothes and the warmth that they need, suffer severe neurological development retardation. Touch is known to boost your immune system. When we're talking about friendships or relationships, we usually do so in terms of touch and intimacy. Someone who is emotionally far from us, we say, is distant. Or disconnected. People that we don't like get on our nerves. Irritable people are touchy. People who get too close are in our personal space. And someone who is too dependent is called clingy. You know, psychologists have even found that the distance that couples talk to one another and converse from one another determines the satisfaction in their marriage. That couples that are more satisfied with their relationship are closer when they talk than those that are dissatisfied. And in some societies, people are even declared untouchable. Every society, in fact, has a group of people that it deems untouchables. People that you're not supposed to hang out with, people you're not supposed to do life with, people that you're not to have intimacy with, people you're not supposed to be friends with. In Jesus' day, it was lepers and Gentiles and women and tax collectors. You know, Jesus did more for women than any man on the in the history of the world. But he didn't just do things for women. Jesus did things for all untouchable people, all the people that society had deemed have cuties. Every society picks, chooses winners and losers, some that have cuties and some that don't. Some you have to stay away from, some that you should get close to. In Jesus' world, there was a group of rabbis. A rabbi is just a teacher. 
but they were very highly esteemed in the Jewish culture. And the rabbi, there was even a group of rabbi called the blind and bleeding Pharisees. They were blind and bleeding Pharisees. They were called this because they were so holy that they didn't even want to look at a woman. And they figured that the best way to beat lust was whenever they would see a woman walking down the street or when they saw her in a building, they would close their eyes so they wouldn't have to look upon her. And so they ran into things. And they hurt themselves. And they fell off things. And they got cuts and bruises. So they called them the blind and bleeding Pharisees. Can you imagine? If they lived today and they lived in Rehoboth and had to drive by the beach. Blind and bleeding car accidents. You see, throughout history, it seems that God's people, religious people, have been attracted to a strategy of isolation. That in order to be holy and to become spiritually mature, it seeps in on the church and on God's people that the way to get holy is to be separate from the unholy, to not have anything to do with them, that, that, that we need to be isolated and quarantined from sinners lest we get their cooties. In Jesus' day, the rabbi taught, the rabbi, the rabbi were the people that everybody came to for wisdom and knowledge and experience. They're like pastors today where people come to church and they would listen to their teaching. That was the rabbi. And the rabbi's philosophy was that the more holy they became, the more spiritual they were, the more inaccessible and unapproachable they were to the everyday person. That when you became holy, you had to quarantine yourself from the unholy. Now, the Bible did teach certain things. You're not to touch certain things, but they had taken that to a whole new level. You see, the Bible says if somebody has leprosy, you don't want to touch them because you might get it. It's kind of like when Patty went over to watch Jason the other day, and she comes home and says, you know, Jason wasn't feeling very well today. And then Mary calls an hour later and says he has foot and mouth disease. Something kids get. And I said, well, I got the foot in mouth disease, but I don't have the hand, his hand foot in mouth disease. It's contagious, so you don't want to touch them. But even though leprosy would spread, the Bible, they, the, the rabbi added to this, the Pharisees added to this, and they said, if a leper comes in your house, you have to tear it down. The Bible never said that. There's a story in the Bible in Luke chapter 7 where Jesus is invited to the home of a Pharisee. The word Pharisee means separated one. Their whole group of people were called the ones that were separated. Their idea of spirituality was to isolate and to quarantine and stay away from people who they thought had cooties. And Jesus is invited over to one of these guys' house. And they're sitting at dinner. And they sat at dinner. They didn't sit in chairs like we do. They reclined at the table like we celebrated at Passover. And they, they, they reclined at the table with their feet sticking out and their arm was up on their head was up on their right arm. And Jesus was reclining at the table when a sinful woman came into the building. The sinful woman began to cry on Jesus' feet. And she began to wash her feet, his feet with her tears. And she began to dry his feet with her hair, and she took a, a flask of perfume and oil, and she opened it up, she poured it on Jesus' head, and she began to minister to Jesus. And the Pharisee was looking at Jesus as a gas. He said, what the heck is going on here? And the Bible says this in chapter 7, verse 39. Now, when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him. In other words, Jesus, if he really was a man of God, would not let this woman touch him. That he would isolate himself and quarantine himself from her. And of course, Jesus had to correct the man's theology, which he did in the rest of the story. You see, if you came down with leprosy or if you were a sinful person in that society, they'd have nothing to do with you. Folks, we live in a sinful society. If we take that approach, all hope is lost. You see, that is not the approach Jesus took. You see, when, they, when, a, leper, when a person came down with leprosy, a person, or whether they were a woman, 
or a Gentile, and that would be most of us. But a leper specifically was isolated. He would never experience touch again. Now, I want you to think about that. We start out by saying every human being needs to be touched. And if you got leprosy back in Jesus' day, it was over. No more high fives when the Eagles score touchdowns. No more hugs consoling each other when you're a Cowboys fan and they lose. No more embrace of your spouse. No longer a pat on the back from your father. I want you to understand, when we talk about lepers in the Bible, that it was the most dreaded disease you could get because you became quarantined and isolated in society, and it even carried a moral stigma, which people believed that if you got leprosy, you committed some kind of bad sin. That it was the judgment of God, and so they didn't have a lot of compassion on you because you obviously had done something wrong, and you deserved it. And that was the religious mindset of the day. And that's the religious mindset that we have been infected with in the church world throughout the 2,000 years of our history. We have been fighting that mindset, that to be holy, we have to be separate, that to be righteous and godly, we can't have anything to do with people that are not righteous and godly. And that is not the approach that Jesus took. Jesus, the most respected rabbi, Jesus, the son of God, was the most approachable human being that's ever lived. And he showed God to be totally different than what they conceived of them because the Jews and the people that were the leaders of the community taught that God was inapproachable, unapproachable, that you couldn't get near him and that God didn't want anything to do with you unless you got everything worked out right and were righteous. Nothing could be further from the truth. You see in the Bible in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, The Bible says the Word became flesh, speaking of Jesus. In fact, this is from the message. The Word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. You see, in their day, they would separate themselves. The priests would live different, live separate from the people because they were holy. But when Jesus came to minister to people, he moved into the neighborhood and he lived and moved among them. One day, a leper came to Jesus in Matthew 8. Verses 1 through 4. A leper came to Jesus and said, Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Clean meaning healed and declared no longer an outcast. And the Jews had a ceremony for that. You'd have to go to the temple and offer some sacrifices and go through a ritual. But this guy comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, if you want to, you can make me clean. The Bible says Jesus did something pretty audacious. It says Jesus touched him. The man did not come asking to be touched. In fact, you'll read many stories in the Bible where the people touched Jesus, that the people went to Jesus seeking a touch for him, but not this leper. This leper understood that it was taboo. This leper understood he was isolated. This This leper understood he was quarantined. He was not allowed to touch or be touched. In fact, he had to stand with his hand up and wave according to the Bible, according to the Scripture. He had to raise his hand and say, unclean, unclean. In other words, don't touch me. Don't touch me because you'll get what I got. It was that man that Jesus touched. And it was scandalous. The leper was shocked. Because he had been taught that he had cooties, and if anybody touched him or looked at him too hard, they'd get cooties too. You see, the miracle Jesus did, or the greatest miracle Jesus did that day was not heal the man. The greatest miracle Jesus did that day was he touched him. And by touching him, he removed that man from isolation. I want you to think of all the things that became possible because of Jesus' touch. Now the man could hug his kids. Now the man could go home and have a relationship with his wife. Now the man could go to his father's house and get a pat on the back. Now the man could high five when the Eagles win a game. Now the man could hug a friend, comfort a loved one 
engage in business, engage in society. Jesus was killed in large part because of that touch. When we look at the death of Jesus on the cross and why they crucified him, there were several reasons why. One of the reasons why was Jesus didn't do things the way they wanted him to do them. One of the major reasons why was that Jesus would not submit to the philosophies and the doctrines that people had added to the Word of God. And for that reason, the religious leaders, mind you, the religious leaders, it wasn't the Romans that killed Jesus. It was the religious leaders that led the charge because Jesus touched people with cooties. In the Bible, <clears throat> there's a vessel called the vessel of mercy. The vessel of mercy was called a vessel of mercy because of its placement. Romans 9 talks about four of the seven vessels that we've looked at. We looked at the vessel of honor, which was a vessel that was to be placed right by your front door where people get a drink of water and use it to wash their feet and refresh themselves. We talked about the vessel of dishonor, which was a vessel of honor that chose to not yield to the potter's touch and got broken or got defiled by some reason it became a trash can and that's never God's will for you to be a trash can. We talked about that. And we talked about the chosen vessel. The chosen vessel was a vessel that was used for missionary service. It was to bear the name of the potter. Next week we're going to look at the clean vessel which is going to be a balance to the things I'm going to finish saying today. You don't want to miss next week. It's very important that we balance what I'm about to say here. That's called a clean vessel. Today I want to talk to you about the vessel of mercy. The vessel of mercy was a vessel of honor that was not placed by the front door of the house or in the temple. It was placed in the public square. It was their version of a water fountain. It was there so people that were traveling could get fresh water. It was there for hospitality. It was there for accessibility. It was there so that people that made their way in and out through society could have a touch and be refreshed by the merciful hand of the community. Its destiny lied in its accessibility. Its destiny lied in the fact that it touched people whom they did not know. John Erkberg continues to write in the book that I shared about the Cootie story and love beyond reason. Only when you get close enough to catch others' hurt will they be close enough to catch your love. Did you hear me, church? That's the vessel of mercy. The vessel of mercy was placed where everybody was out in the square, and they could be touched by anyone. There was no barrier. There was no requirements. There was no restrictions. It was there for everybody. You see, Jesus did not call his followers to live in a spiritual quarantine. He called them to be vessels of mercy. Paul writes here, he says, What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels, excuse me, the vessels of wrath, <clears throat> that communion wafer gets stuck in my throat every time. We're going to talk about the vessel wrath in a few weeks. You don't want to miss it. You want to know the grace of God, you've got to understand that vessel. But that's a commercial. You have to come back. He endured much long suffering that and that he might, verse 23, make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. That's us. Which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Jesus did not call us to live in a spiritual quarantine where we're holier than thou. Jesus called us to be vessels of mercy. We're like doctors in a hospital. You know, when a doctor has a day, a long day, and he comes home, he doesn't say it was a great day because he wasn't infected with a disease. He doesn't come and say, wow, honey, let me share with you my day. It was a great day. I didn't have to see any patients. 
That's not why he went to medical school. He went to medical school so he could touch, so he could heal, so he could be accessible to people that were ill. And that's what God has called us to be, is there's people that are spiritually ill outside of this church. Our culture is spiritually ill. It is sick. And Jesus himself said in the Gospels, he did not call, come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance, that a doctor, that people that are sick need a physician. And so Jesus' followers took Jesus at his words. And history records in the first few centuries that when a plague, and the Roman Empire was hit by plagues, you know, every 15 years. With every 15 years, they'd have a plague somewhere. And when a plague hit, 30 to 40% of the people would die of the plague. And so when, as soon as a plague hit, the wealthy people, the powerful people in the community would leave for their summer homes and move and leave the rest of the poor people behind in the plague-infested city. You see, in their value system, in their belief system, their pagan belief system, nothing taught them that humans had dignity. Nothing taught them to be compassionate. Nothing taught them to put themselves out there. But then Jesus came along, and Jesus taught the human dignity that we're made in the image of God and that we're worth dying for each other. And so the Christians began to follow Jesus' example, and they began, when plagues would hit, they began to minister. They would run to the cities and administer to the sick, and many of them caught the disease and died to be a vessel of mercy. Our destiny as a church here is not to necessarily die, but our destiny is to be a vessel of mercy. And if we're going to impact this 120,000 people that are a 15-mile region, folks, we got to go out to them. We got to get engaged in their world. We got to get close enough to them to catch the disease. Now, there's some risk. I want you to come back next week. I'm going to balance this because there's something I'm not saying. But, folks, we really have to understand why God has brought us together. We are vessels of mercy. And our church is to be a vessel of mercy. And that's the reason why we're doing good. The reason why we do our do good campaign is not because we have things. Do you know how much busier it makes us on the staff? I have to be honest with you, folks. My wife and I don't have a life in the month of July because we're running around trying to get all the do good done. It'd be easier not to do good. I'm not trying to make you busy. What we're trying to do is help you understand that you are a vessel of mercy, that we have to put ourselves out of there. We've got to, we've got to remove ourselves sometimes from the pace of our lives and do something for somebody else. We're not going to change modern living, but what we can do when we're driving through the drive through we can begin to be sensitive to the person behind us. When we're in traffic, and this is a big area for my wife, Patty. She gets mad driving all the time. I'm trying to remember this one when I'm driving in traffic and everybody's in my way. I'm important. I got places to go. I need a $54 million jet. That one's really bothering me. I usually bring those things up in sermons, but that one's really bothering me. $25 million is fine. Get me a $25 million one and be fine. We do good in July to put ourselves out there. To be vessels of mercy in a world that desperately needs mercy. We do good because serving and showing compassion, making ourselves available through service is what Christ's followers do. Chuck Colson writes in his book, How Now Shall We Live? And I'm going to wrap this up. We'll get you out of here. He writes in his book, How Now Shall We Live? He says, there is no basis for compassion in alternative worldviews. Speaking of Christianity, there's no other world's belief system that gives us a foundation for compassion. And I warned last night, and I'll warn again. As America continues to lose and leave behind its Judeo-Christian values, are you seeing the connection of how we are losing compassion? Our very foundation for being tolerant is dissipating like sand, like a sandcastle on the beach. 
And now we've lost civility. Now we can't even talk to each other about different subjects but which we disagree. Now, if we disagree with each other, there's no tolerance. Tolerance today is coming to mean that you agree with me. And the reason for that is you check out any belief system. Do a study of religions in the world I have. There is no belief system other than Christianity, biblical Christianity, that lays a foundation of people that are going to be compassionate. Jesus taught that compassion and service is the ethos, the ethic of a Christ follower. And he modeled it in his ministry, and he modeled it in his cross, and he modeled it in his resurrection, and he modeled it in his ascension, and he's modeling it through his people. Because Chuck Colson's right, there is no basis for compassion in alternate worldviews. He shares a story. He says, only Christianity provides a motive for compassion. And he shares a story. He says, while visiting a prison in Trivandrum, India, some years ago, I saw firsthand what the Hindu caste system does to human dignity. Now, folks... America keeps saying that we can believe anything we want and we can embrace all these different worldviews, but folks, we need to pay attention to what they really produce. The reason America is great is not because we're so smart a people. The reason we are great is because of our value system, and if we reject our value system, we are reject, rejecting the very compassion that made us great in the first place. He says, our team was welcomed warmly to the old colonial era structure by a group of well-dressed corrections officers. And we were immediately surrounded by a cordon of Indian guards in summer dress khaki uniform, knee-length shorts, red apulets on their shoulders, and swagger sticks under their arms. As they marched just to the flower-bedecked center platform, I could almost hear the strains of the Colonel Boogie March. In the field before us were at least a thousand inmates, most of them untouchables. You see, at least in that society, they're honest about their untouchables. That person's untouchable. We don't say it in our society, but we have them. Their sweaty, dark skin contrasted with their white loincloths, their only clothing. They rested submissively on their haunches, their eyes fearfully darting from side to side. These men were not only condemned to this horrid institution, where they were caged in squalid holes with no toilets or no running water. But even worse, they were totally dehumanized, treated as outcasts. They were lepers, not physically, but metaphorically. No Hindu who lived by his beliefs would care one whit for them. Study Hinduism. He's right. I spoke that day through a Hindu translator, sharing my own testimony in the gospel of Jesus Christ. When I talked about the forgiveness of sins, I saw many eyes open wide, startled. This was a radical thought. You see, in Hinduism, there is no forgiveness. What we celebrated today, saying in Hinduism, there isn't this. Whatever wrong you and I have done in this life must be repaid in one's next incarnation according to the iron law of karma. You reap what you sow, not in this life, but if you sow bad in this life, you're going to reap bad in the next life. And there's no hope of forgiveness. So as a result, Colson says, no consistent Hindu would practice charity, for that would interfere with the law of karma. And people tell me today that our beliefs don't matter. They do. What you believe is the most important thing in your life. Your life will become the product of your beliefs. How do I know that? I've told my kids since they were little, I said to them, your life will be shaped and become the product of your decisions. And then I said, your decisions will be shaped by your beliefs. A new life in Christ, Chuck said. Their sins washed away, freedom, 
The inmates were astounded by these ideas. A thousand pair of eyes riveted on me intently, many of them glistening with tears. After the prayer of invitation, I settled the guards, I startled the guards and the dignitaries by jumping down off the platform and walking toward the crowd, thrusting out my hand to the first man I could reach. It was pure impulse. I sensed that I should let the men know that I wanted to touch them. Suddenly, like a flight of birds, men rose to their feet and circled me. If you've never been in a foreign country, folks, didn't this happen in Indonesia? We had our own experience in Indonesia, folks. Five, I bet you I laid hands on 5,000 people and prayed for them within a week. They just wanted to be touched. Touch me, pastor. Play, pray a blessing over me. This, this is what he's experiencing. Most of them just reached out and touched. I felt hands all over my arms, my chest, and my back. They were desperate for touch to know that the love of God is real. They kept swapping positions with one another until virtually all had made physical contact with me. Later, when these men went back to their grim cells, he says, I don't know how many people there submitted their lives to Christ. He says, but at least one message got across. That in Christianity, that in Christ, they are not untouchable. You might be here this morning and think you've gone too far, that your life's untouchable. You haven't. You haven't gone too far. There's not a person here that's beyond the reach and the touch of Jesus Christ. But we got a world out there, folks. And the reason why people are hurting one another is hurting people hurt people. And the way we're going to change our culture, the way we're going to make America great again, the way we're going to give us a future and a hope for our kids is that we're going to learn to be vessels of mercy. Let Christ transform your life. Let him put the clean, crystal clear water of the Holy Spirit inside your heart. Get refilled. That's why we come to church, to get refilled, because we leak. And then go out and touch the world. Stand with me as we wrap this up. You don't want to miss next week as I talk about what happens when we go out and touch the world and how we need to live a balanced life so that our service doesn't do a disservice to us but this morning we're talking about touching a world that has cooties and putting ourselves out there if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior you need a touch from him there are going to be some people here that would love to pray with you and introduce you to this grace to this forgiveness that you can have a new beginning if you're here this morning and need prayer and you're for healing in your body or help in your life, they'll be glad to pray with you for that. If you're a first-time guest, I want to guess and I want to invite you to starting point in the back of the church. Don't leave here. And folks, let me encourage all of you. Before you leave today, take a moment and say something to somebody else in the building. Say hello, shake their hand. I know for you introverts it's a little bit more difficult. Extroverts like me can't shake enough hands. And then you, as you're leaving, you can wash your hands with disinfectant. (laughs) Touch somebody and be touched. That's the reason we gather, to be touched by God, but to have a human touch. That's what community is about. You cannot do church. You can't be the church. You can't be the community when you don't come. We need each other. You'll live longer. Your immune system will get better. Life will be better. Father, as we leave this morning, I pray, help us be vessels of mercy. First of all, towards one another. And then, Lord, when we go out of here, every one of us have different jobs and different opportunities and different challenges. As we go out of here and we take these cards, let us go touch our world and let them know who's touching them. We are touching them, blessing them in the name of Jesus and blessing them in the name of our church that not only does Jesus love them, but we love them and we are his hands and his feet. 
his vessels of mercy. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. May God bless you. We'll see you next week. You don't want to miss next week as we balance these things that we're saying. May God bless you and go with you.